uncertainty. We all have uncertainty in our lives. But what does it mean that uncertainty creates the freedom to discover meaning? What are the options we have when we are making a mistake in our work or in our art? And how it all relates to creative mindfulness? Dr. Ellen Langer, who has been researching mindfulness for over 40 years, will speak with us about mistakes, uncertainty, living a mindful life, and much more. So let's start. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it's misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Hey, welcome back. When you think about your mistakes, what do you think about? Do you see more opportunities to grow and discover new things? Or, you see, like many in our modern society, mistakes as something to avoid at all costs. Businesses, especially, are striving to eliminate mistakes. Often, they will punish us for doing the mistakes. But as our guest today, Dr. Ellen Langer, will show, mistakes are great opportunities to have a better and interesting life and in business, probably more superior products. Dr. Langer is a professor of psychology at Harvard University. She is the recipient of four Distinguished Science Award and the Liberty Science Genius Award. She is considered the mother of mindfulness and the positive psychology, and she wrote more than 200 articles and numerous bestseller books. This conversation is not about art. It is about the art of living. Dr. Langer, welcome to the Artian Podcast. Thank you, Nier. Dr. Langer, you are considered the mother of mindfulness, and you have been researching this topic in the last 30 years, maybe more. 40. 40. 40. So I'm already happy to know that um, we have such a, an interesting topic to discuss, mindfulness and obviously art. Now, I want to kind of maybe set the stage here and ask you, what do you mean being mindful. What is it exactly being mindful? You know, Nir, it's, it's very funny. It is so simple. It almost defies belief when you think of the consequences that result from being mindful. So mindfulness, as we study it, is the very simple process of actively noticing new things. When you actively notice new things, that puts you in the present, makes you sensitive to context and perspective. And it's the process of engagement. So it feels good. And we have data showing that it's energy creating rather than consuming. So it feels good. It's good for you. The results um, have over, you know, I've done a lot of studies. It's been, as you've said, a lot of years. And we find that people are healthier. They're happier. Their work improves. Relationships improve. It affects virtually everything. And what is pleasing to me is that it doesn't require practice. It's a very natural process. So if you were going to come visit me, right now I'm in Cape Cod, my house. If you've never been here before, you'd get off the plane and everything would seem new to you. And you'd be looking for all the new things and you'd be enjoying yourself. You wouldn't have to practice it. But the reason that most people most of the time are mindless, which is sad, but true, um, is because they think they know. And when you think you know, there's no reason to sit up and pay any attention. And so what people need to realize is that uncertainty is the rule, not the exception. Everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. So if you really understood that it was all new, then you would naturally just be mindful the way children are for example, the way you would be if you came to visit me. You said so many, so many things that I already want to ask you about. But before that, I want to take you a kind of one step backward. You mentioned that people can become healthier, happier, better energy. But in one of the interviews, you said that we are kind of taught to be mindless. Yes. 
Well, you know, I'm not sure exactly why. I'm, I'm very sure that it's true. I would guess that we're taught to be mindless because that maintains the power structure. That leaves the status quo in, in place. You know, you don't question your particular position in society. If everything is always changing and you see everything can be understood in different ways and that you have to ask who decided what the criteria are for excellence. And once you do that, and then you say that there are different criteria that could be used, then you have different people who may end up on top. So that's one possibility, I don't know. But schools around the globe teach us to look for absolutes. You know, the one that I'm fond of saying, trying to explain this to people, I might ask, how much is one in one? So, Nir, how much is one in one? <laughs> okay, so you've heard me say this before. <laughs> Eventually, the whole I, I world will depend. know what the answer. <laughs> the whole world will know the answer is no it's longer two. two. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, you know, you say two, but it turns out that even this, the most simple fact that we think we, we know for sure is not always two. If you added, oh, let's say, one pile of laundry to one pile of laundry, one plus one equals one. One uh, wad of chewing gum plus one wad of chewing gum, one plus one equals one. In I fact, in the this. real world, one plus one probably doesn't equal two as often as it does. Not only that, but one plus one equaling two is based on a base 10 number system. If you're using a base two number system, one plus one is written as 10. So once you see that you don't know, then you tune in and everything becomes new and exciting. Now, part of the reason that people want to feel that they know they want these absolutes is because they think it gives them more control over the world and over their lives. But in fact, it robs you of control because you're holding things still when in fact they're varying. And it's much easier to recognize that you don't know when you see that you really can't know because it's changing and, as I said, looks different from different perspectives. So you have lots of people around the world, especially in business settings and the schools as well, where they pretend because I know I don't know. You may know. I don't want you to know that I don't know. <laughs> and so uh, it leads to lots of inauthentic interactions. However, once you know that I don't know, but I know you don't know either because you can't know, then not knowing has a different feel to it. So I'm suggesting that instead of making a personal attribution for uncertainty, which is I don't know, but it's knowable, to make a universal attribution, I don't know, you don't know, nobody can know, again, because it's always changing. So I'll tell you the story about me. Often people ask me, oh, you are the expert. And I tell them, that's the worst curse you can tell me, an expert. I don't want to be an expert because I want to know that I don't know. So at least I'll be curious to continue and explore and challenge my own way of thinking. And what you said about not knowing and feeling comfortable with it kind of link directly to art, which leads me to the reason I so wanted to have you on this podcast. Because in 2005, you published a book on becoming an artist, reinventing yourself through mindful creativity. Now, honestly, when I read it, I was amazed by the topics you already discussed 16 years ago. It's like uh, some of the ideas that you mentioned over there kind of became so popular in the last two, three years, but it's probably things that you have been dealing for years. I want to ask you, what do you mean when you say mindful creativity? Okay, so yeah, this is funny. So the first book I published in this series is called Mindfulness. The second book I published was called Mindful Learning. So the first question that I was asked in the past was, what's the difference between mindful <laughs> learning and mindfulness? And there is no difference. It's just that you have to have a new title with each book. <laughs> All right. So um, it's the same thing with mindful creativity. Creativity is, is an interesting topic where people think that it's a function of the product and it's not. Mindfulness is the process. And if you engage in a mindful process, you're probably going to end up with a better product. But so the difference between creativity and mindfulness is, again, attention to product or process. So if I developed uh, the theory of relativity, nobody is going to applaud me because Einstein did it first. However, 
uh, it would still be mindful if I came up with it myself. That's a very interesting and new perspective for me. So I want to ask you, what led you actually to get into art? How did you find yourself becoming an artist? There, were, there was a time, I guess it was 2004 or three, whenever it was, where it just seemed to rain the whole summer. And so everybody is stuck in their houses. You can go out because it's not freezing. It's uh, still a summer rain. But all the gay, you know, activities like tennis and so on that we'd be playing, we weren't playing. So at some point I left the house and I went to see, uh, had to deliver something to a friend or just met a friend at the hardware store, wherever it was. And she said, uh, she was an artist. And she said, so how are you spending your time? <laughs> I don't know why I said this, uh, you know, I said, um, you know, I told her what I was doing, whatever it was. And I said, but I'm thinking of taking up art. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. She dragged me back to her studio and she gave me two tiny canvases, small canvases and as a gift. And she said, I said, well, you know, I only need one <laughs> because I didn't think I was going to use even that. And she said, no, no. Uh, take both because it shouldn't be too precious and you shouldn't have to be so concerned with what you're doing if you only have one. Later that day, I had to visit uh, somebody who is an extraordinary artist and uh, we're talking and then she said to me something, I, I don't remember what she said, I must have been some version of, so how are you keeping yourself busy? <laughs> Which was the question you asked everybody since all it was doing was raining. And I said to her, this had become my, this is what you say to an artist, is I'm thinking of taking up art. <laughs> and she then said, oh, fabulous. Get yourself a giant canvas and just do it. Well, so one is a tiny canvas, yeah. one is a giant. But the instruction was the same, was to just do it. So I get back to my house uh, with the little tiny canvas, but I, I found a shingle. And I didn't have many paints around. So, you know, I had house paints. But I painted something on the shingle. And I was just doing it. And then I saw, it was interesting. It was a girl on a horse, sort of a girl, sort of a horse, because I can't draw, and uh, racing through the woods. And I thought, well, gee, it's interesting. I wonder if the fact that I painted it on wood led to the content, you know, going through the woods. And so it started to have some psychological meaning to me. And I really liked it. Um, the little painting. And as I say in the in the book, you know, I didn't know how to evaluate whether it was any good. I knew because there were people if I showed it to just because I did it, they would say it was great. And there'd be just as many because I did it who would say it was awful. <laughs> so I went to a store, an art supply store. And I said, you know, I asked them, should I paint over this or just, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, and that person also liked it could have also been for other reasons who knows but now my career my art career had started and what i did was i would paint and then something would happen and it would interest me as a psychologist and uh, so then i would run a study to see if what had happened was true in general or just you know for me for some peculiar reason and that's how uh, all of the the studies using art to begin with started, you know, to discover that once you make a mistake and you go forward with that mistake rather than go back, that the painting, the drawing, the essay, whatever it is you're creating comes alive and is superior, oddly, to even when you don't make a mistake. So I want to stop you over here and ask you a question because, and I quoting over here from the book, because I think the topic of mistakes is so important in our society. And the quotes go like this. Consider the following. You are in the midst of drawing and you make a mistake. There are four possible ways for you to think about what to do next. One, consider it as a mistake. And since mistakes are intolerable, throw the drawing out. Two, consider the work you have put into the drawing. Take another look at the mistake and conclude you will live with it. Three, try to fix the mistake so that everything just as it was before you made it. Four, reconsider the mistake and decide to take advantage of it. Now, if I got it correct, do you recommend kind of option four? Well, take not it kind of. No, I strongly recommend option four. But, you know, let me interrupt you because this, you know, as I said, so I would start with the uh, painting. Something would happen, in this case, a mistake. And then I would think about it and run a study. But this one turns out, I think, to be rather important that 
for everything that we're doing, whether in business, art, no matter where. We decide how to do it. And then what we do once we go forward, we forget that what we're doing was based on a decision. And for something to be a decision means there was uncertainty. So to start off, you're uncertain, you decide what to do, you start doing it, now you make a mistake. Now, if you make that mistake and you forget that you weren't sure what to do in the first place, you know, instead, once we make the decision, we act as if the decision was given to us from the heavens or something. And so if you have that view, then of course you want to immediately correct it and go back to where you had initially started because that was the right answer. But if you retain the, you know, the understanding that no, it was just a decision, there was uncertainty. So why not go someplace new? You weren't sure in the first place. And then it's much easier. And as I said before that in these studies, what we find is after the products are created and we have other people evaluate them, those that were the result of a mistake were considered superior to even no mistake. Because when you're not making mistakes, very often you're doing what you're doing mindlessly. And somehow that leaves its imprint on the product we produce. It's interesting because you suggest to incorporate the mistakes into the plan, but businesses don't like mistakes. I mean, specifically, if I put it in my world, you are being punished for making mistakes. How can individual that listen to us now can actually incorporate his or her mistake on their day to day, even in their in environment that might punish them for their mistakes? Well, you know, you may be punished for your mistake unless you come up with a superior product. You know, so uh, we go back to a company that was trying to produce a glue and they put lots of money, resources, ego into producing this glue. And what happened is the glue failed to adhere. So a terrible mistake, right? Very, very costly. And they could have ended there and done one of those four things that you cited. They could have just said, you know, oh my God, this is not for me. I'm just give up the whole company, you know, and so on. But instead what they did was took advantage of the property failure to adhere and created the post-it note. And I think 3M made far more money with post-it notes than they would have with yet another glue, but who knows? But, you know, so in other words, once you make the mistake and you make use of that mistake, at the end, you end up with possibly a superior product and no one is going to punish you for that. And I don't know who wants to work in in that sort of business anyway, where you're, you know, I I did this consulting many years ago for this very big uh, power and light company, and they had a policy of zero uh, accidents, zero mistake, essentially. And the first thing I told them is all they're doing is increasing the uh, probability of lies. Mistakes will happen. And so uh, rather than run from from them, exploit the power that, that you can find in that mistake. And all of that, again, is much easier to do when you recognize the original plan was just a choice. There was no way of knowing if it was good or bad at the outset. You know, even a simple thing, you know, do you want to go out for a falafel or for you know, <laughs> Chinese food that as soon as you ask the question, it's because, you know, they seem at that moment equal to you. So if you say, OK, well, let's go for a falafel and you go to the falafel stand and the guy closed the stand. And so it seems like it was a bad decision. Right. Because you can't get the falafel. If you were aware that you weren't sure, did you want Chinese food or falafel in the first place? Now you'd probably say, okay, great, let's go get Chinese food. Totally. You know, no, whereas no if you say the, the, yeah, if you say the only way I can be satisfied now is with a falafel. I mean, if you were in Israel, I guess it would be easy to find another place to buy a falafel. <laughs> I really love it, the example that you gave with the forecast, that if we say it's going to be 65 degrees and then we get it wrong, so it's a mistake. But if we say it's about 65... Or it may be 65. Just yeah. the addition of one word kind of allow us room for much more possibilities. Science is based on probabilities. But the problem is that those probabilities become absolute facts in lectures, oftentimes, uh, certainly in textbooks. 
And so what happens is people are taught from the beginning of school straight through uh, their lives to expect that things can be certain. And, you know, so deviating from a certainty feels very different from deviating from a probability. You know, you just go into it quite differently, as you were suggesting. It already sounds like a quote. Let's take a short break and then we'll continue. Would you like to work personally with Nier to develop and grow your artistic mindset? At the Artian, we work with organizations and individuals to achieve greater success. Through our art-based leadership sales and innovation training, we show organizations that there is another way of thinking and another possibility of acting. Visit us at www.theartian.com. That is T-H-E-A-R-T-I-A-N.com to learn more. Great. Dr. Langer, many of the things that you say kind of relate a lot to art, whether I want to see it or whether it's, it is like that. But I hear quite often that companies and, and organizations want to put humans in the center. And there is a, even now a term for it, user, a human-centric design. And for me, art is, was and is always about human, for human, about human. And one of the things you said is that the goal with your book was to put people back in the equation. What do you mean? The, when we develop facts, we often act as if somehow, again, they were handed down from the heavens. When we put people back in the equation, suggesting how this fact came about, uh, it becomes clear that it could have been a little different. You know, even with science, to go back to experiments, you run a study, you, you choose your variables and your independent variables, and then you take your measures and so on, that with a slight difference, let's say if I were assessing the effectiveness of a drug, right, you have to make a decision how much of that drug to give, when to give it, to whom to give it, how often to give it. Now, there's an art to this. Before the drug is ever given to anybody, is ever tested, there's no way of knowing. You know, if you give a tiny bit, that doesn't mean, and it doesn't work, but more might have worked. If you give too much, then it might not work. Whereas if you gave a little less, it might work. And so all of these decisions that are made by the scientists are ignored or people are blind to them when you're given the results of the studies. So what I'm telling you is that there's an art to the science. There's an art to all decision-making. Everything is, if everything is uncertain, uh, then everything is in some sense a guess. And when you appreciate that, then there's, there's much more room for, for people to um, explore different ways of doing things. Now, when I say putting people back in the equation, what I'm saying is that, you know, an example I use, let's say there's a sign uh, on somebody's lawn that says, keep off the grass. Even something silly like that. People act as if I don't, you, you must keep off the grass. No Israeli would, but, you know, and possibly New Yorkers wouldn't, but most people in the rest of the world. Now, imagine that the sign said, Ellen says, keep off the grass. So you're going to say, who's Ellen? <laughs> Maybe I can negotiate with her. Maybe she doesn't even live here anymore. Maybe she now has different feelings about her lawn. Everything becomes mutable. All sorts of possibilities result. So what happens is if you want people to blindly obey, you leave people out of the equation. You say cigarettes are bad for your health, period. If you want people to make their own decisions, you might say in this study by Ellen and Neer, uh, they found that when you do this, for most people, this is what you find. That's very different, right? And so then people can choose to follow or not follow. Like, I'm not you know, suggesting people should smoke or not smoke. It's just to make the point. You, know, you walk into a room, you sit down in a chair, you're uncomfortable. Now, if you recognize that the height of that chair, the width of that chair, every aspect of that chair was a decision that a person made and could have been decided differently. 
So if it doesn't make you comfortable, you're more likely, if you realize this, to bring a pillow, to put something under, you know, the legs of the chair, to make it higher, you know, to, to change things. So putting people back in the equation, making that everybody aware that it was person constructive, whether it's an idea or a thing, gives people more control over their lives and recognizing that they can change it to better meet their needs. So it's kind of led me to my next question, because along these lines, I also see how being mindful, how putting people in the center again, kind of come through the research that you did with the example of the classic orchestra. That basically, even though it's a very structured and very definite a way to execute this piece, you allowed room and that brought different results. Can you tell us about this? Sure. You know, symphony musicians, uh, orchestra members, um, play very often the same pieces over and over and over again. Now they, you know, so they're bored. Not everybody, but too many. And um, they stay there because the salary is good, the status is good, and so on. But they're bored. So we take these symphonies, these musicians, these orchestras, <laughs> excuse me, and we're going to make them more mindful or allow them to be mindless. So when they're made more mindful, they're instructed, we want you to play, and every orchestra that we use is playing the same piece of music, but we're told, we want you to make it new in very subtle ways that only you would know. And it has to be subtle because they're playing classical music, okay? The comparison group is told, remember a time you played this piece and you were very pleased with it. I tried to replicate your performance. And those are always a version of the instructions we're using. Make it new versus same old, same old. We record the pieces played and then we play them for people who uh, don't know anything about the study. And it turns out people overwhelmingly prefer the mindfully played piece. And the musicians prefer playing it in this mind, more mindful way. But what was interesting and relevant to business that I didn't realize until I wrote up the study was here we had a situation where everybody was in a sense doing their own thing, but it resulted in superior coordinated um, product and experience. And because if they're all taking their cues from the present moment in some sense, and they're all in the same moment, um, there's going to be a, a, a synchrony that's going to result. And so that led me to believe that perhaps the main job of the leader, the manager, whoever is in charge, is to encourage, provoke the mindfulness of those being led rather than lead with such a heavy hand. And you don't lead with a heavy hand. We go back to your first question about making mistakes. You know, the, the person who uh, is running that company, I think is probably very mindless, thinking they know. Um, and so you can't deviate at all. And recognizing that you don't know uh, makes it easier to encourage people to explore, do it their own way. And then everybody enjoys what they're doing more. But most important from a business perspective, I guess, is that you end up with a superior product. So I have a question for you. Do you think that art or artist invites this way of exploration or being comfortable with the unknown? If you took a random group of artists and a random group of any you know, businessmen, uh, probably. But, you know, that art can be done mindlessly and business can be done mindfully. And so, you know, I think that the more su the, the success of many business is a function of the mindfulness of the people in charge. So I have another question for you now, because, and I'll go back to mindful creativity. Unless passionate about art and creativity, most of us probably did our last artwork when we were at sixth or eighth grade. And you see it always with people that they kind of, when they get to the real life, it's set aside. But you have a very nice sentence that I like that you say, now is yesterday later. Why we shy away from creativity? Why not to take advantage? And why you encourage people to do it now? Yeah, well, you know, I didn't start painting until I was 50 years old. And I was one of those kids in school who thought people who could, you know, people who were 
talented, were people who could draw or sing. I can't carry a tune either, uh, but I sing all the time. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it came about again by somebody. I wondered what mark could a child put on a page that would lead a teacher to lead them to believe that they can't do it? You know, when you look at famous artists, you go from Clay, Mondrian, Picasso, in addition to the Rembrandts and so on. That art is can be so many different things. And the act of creating is so exciting that people should not be denied, shouldn't deny themselves. Even cooking, the same thing. You know, you can cook by religiously following the recipe and being nervous if you know, if a little too much salt yeah. goes in or you, or you run out of sugar or whatever it is. Or you can again say, this recipe was just developed by people. And if you go back to art and you say, you know, the impressionists that people pay millions and millions of dollars for, that art was initially rejected. And then something happened where I have uh, this friend who drinks too much and she was an art collector, a very wealthy uh, woman who... Uh, saw some of my paintings and said, she had too much to drink. She said, now, Ellen, you know, I think there's something really there. She says, now, don't go thinking uh, that you're Rembrandt. And because they had a little too much to drink, I didn't tell her, but I said to myself at that time, and Rembrandt isn't me. And what that meant was that if I am the best Ellen Langer, no one can do me better than I can. And I'd rather be an original Ellen Langer than a 5,500,000 uh, Rembrandt, you know, never quite being as good as Rembrandt. But I come nowhere near it, but my art is an entirely different thing. But the main thing is that creating it is such fun. The idea that when you start, it doesn't really get exciting for me until I make a mistake. You know, I start off, what should I paint? Okay, so I'm going to paint... Um, uh, looking at you with the uh, plant behind you. That's what I'm going to paint. And I started, it doesn't look anything like you. It barely even looks like the plant. So then I step away for a second. I come back and I look. I said, well, what does it look like? Rather than what doesn't it look like? And that's the same thing with what we were saying before about making any mistake. You know, what else might it be? And, and then just go forward with it. You can't make a mistake if you don't know where you're going. If I'm trying to do an exact replica of you and it doesn't look like you, that's a mistake. But if I wanted an exact replica of you, I could just take a photograph. Anyway, the, the reason I think that people should engage in these artistic pursuits is just because it's fun, it's engaging, it's a way to be mindful. But you don't have to do art. I think that one should live life this way. And you live life this way when you're aware of a few things. One, that virtually everything is was put there by people, which means that other people could have put it there differently, which gives you lots of latitude to do it your own way. When you realize that evaluation is not in the thing that you're creating, but rather it's a view people are taking of that thing, things of this sort and recognizing that what is good today may be considered bad tomorrow and good uh, the day after, and so on, that all of these things change. You know, even a how to be in a, in a general way, that no matter how you are, if somebody wants to see it as negative, there's a way to do so. You know, I did this thing when I was very young. I you know, did this thing for a friend that I thought was fabulously generous, and she thought... I was being grandiose. Yeah, I guess to be, to try to be that generous may be grandiose, you know? And so then I started thinking more about it and realized everything can be turned inside out. So I am fabulously trusting and that makes me very gullible. Um, I'm wonderfully flexible, but that makes me inconsistent. And I am... Uh, very spontaneous, but, you know, that makes me impulsive. So the point is that no matter what behavior we're describing, there's an equally potent but oppositely valenced alternative. So when you recognize that no matter what you do, if somebody wants to make it into something bad, they can do that. 
then you're freer to sort of do what you you want to do. And um, if people do do it their own way, then life becomes much more exciting and meaningful. Too many people sell out. You can do it your way or their way, whoever they are, and you can succeed or you can fail. And to me, the most costly is when you give up what matters to you, you do it their way and you fail. You define yourself as an untaught artist, not a self untaught. No, untaught. <laughs> what do you mean untaught artist? Well, you know, self-taught uh, suggests that now you have a specific way of doing things. Untaught is that the moment determines how you're going to do it. You take every sentence that I write, which is very flattering, <laughs> and presume there was enormous wisdom for every word written. But, you know, so I think that calling myself untaught was to stress that um, in many ways, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm having a good time. <laughs> um, if I were to try to make that sound fancy, then I'd give my original explanation, which is that untaught suggests that it's not rule driven. Yeah. You speak and I hear all the time a characteristic that I see often among artists, probably among probably psychologists and scientists and entrepreneurs as well, is questioning, always questioning the norms, the rules, etc. So if we are talking about questionings, now what I want to do is that I have a series of quotes by you, and I would like to get your thought on each and every one of them, if that's okay with you. And the first one saying, be confident in your uncertainty. What do you mean? Okay. People conflate confidence and certainty. I think that's a mistake, as I've said, since everything is uncertain, that the stance that one should assume, aspire to, is to be confident, but uncertain. You know, so that's why, you know, I walk around and I'm, I'm happy and I'm confident um, and I have no idea what's going to happen <laughs> next. And, and that's just fine because I don't think anybody else does either. I'm like you in that. The second quote. When we look at art in museums, we can see how many disparate styles there are, but we act in our creative life as if there is one single standard. What do you mean? If I asked people who think that they can't draw to draw a horse, you know, many would be paralyzed by yeah. the thought of having to draw something. <laughs> but if you look through time across culture, you have very, very many varieties of horses from single lines from someone let's say like a picasso to very involved uh, detailed work and so on and when you recognize all these different styles it's easier again i think for you to pursue your own and to create what does a horse mean to you who decides you see part of the book talks about our notions of talent as if again the criteria come from the heavens who decides Uh, how big something should be, how dark it should be, how light it should be. These are all matters of preference, not, again, uh, things that are dictated. And so I think that, you know, for me, everything becomes a, a question and a, of interest. You know, if I were to buy a pocketbook, which I haven't done for 40 years, but if I were to... It's probably not entirely true, um, you know, and they had bags that were round and bags that were rectangular and ba bags that were square. And I found myself looking more at one shape than another. I would then ask myself why. And, and that would be interesting to me. Why is it that, let's say, something rectangular is more interesting to me um, than something round? And was that the way it was 10 years ago? And, you know, what does it all mean? So no matter what one is doing, there's a way to make it interesting and exciting. Now, I think the conversation I have with myself about shapes probably wouldn't be interesting to many people, but there are always questions that can be asked. But you don't ask the question when you think that everything is a nice, neat package. Yeah, many people uh, tell me often that I ask too many questions. <laughs> so, but just like you, it's like I'm always interested why things the way they are uh, and why we do what we do. So another Or, quote. But, but I think something you should add to that is how could we do it differently? And how can we do it differently from that and so on? So what happens is that in schools, in families, people, when they ask questions, are expecting and are satisfied with single answers. And I think 
uh, starting the, the first time somebody asks a question, a multiple answer should be given. Well, you know, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. And, you know, it, it creates for the individual, I think, a very different world growing up, a world of possibilities. Totally, totally, totally agree with everything you say. Um, that's why I really love art, because art is open-ended. Art invites possibilities. What you see, what I see, what person totally different will see. Everyone can see different things. And nobody has to be the one that is the right one because there is no right answer. So I have another quote that I love by you. And you say, believing is seeing. What do you mean? Yeah. Well, people typically think seeing is believing, um, especially in today's world where they can um, uh, take any image and, you know, you can take an image of a man and make him a woman, make somebody old, somebody young, put somebody who's never worn a bathing suit into, you know, into the ocean, you know, and so on. So you can't really believe what you see. But prior to all this technology, people said seeing is believing. But it turns out that your beliefs determine what you see. And so it's very important that you open up those beliefs so that you open up all that you can see. You know, when you're uh, looking for X's in, you know, on a page with X's and O's and whatever else, all you notice are the X's. And so <clears throat> you want to, in a sense, loosen your expectation. Now, I just did this research. So this is, we'll say more conjecture because we haven't replicated it yet. But, um, you know, when you're looking for something and you can't find it, and then it turns out it was right in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, have you had that experience? You know, where are my keys? Every day. Where, every day. Okay. So I think most people have had it. And what happens is when you're looking for something, you sort of tighten your image, your expectation of what it is. You know, so if you were looking for that pen that's in your hand, you would try to get a, a better idea of just what that pen looked like and then search. But the way to actually find that item is to loosen your expectation. Because the pen, you're expecting it to be like this, you know, in one orientation, and it may be like this. And so you're not going to see it. Or, you know, your, your phone, um, you know, it could be in this angle, and you're looking for this. And so if you learn about things conditionally in the first place, then it's easier to remember them, find them in the second place. But so all that rigidity that we, that we impose on ourselves, all that mindlessness that's done in the service of having control over our lives is so costly, even with the simple point of finding an item, you know, that our expectations, the stronger your expectation, the more blind you're going to be to any deviation from that expectation. I think you said also that once we are taught to think inside the box, then we are taught to think outside the box. But you always yeah. asking, who put who the put box? The box there? <laughs> right. Right. Dr. Lange, we are getting into the end of the podcast. I really, really enjoy our conversation. I'm, I'm kind of interested. We are talking about a book that was published in 2005, which I highly recommend everyone to read because it's relevant in every point. And I wonder, do you think something has changed? since you published this book toward mindfulness, toward a more creative life, toward intersection of both? Um, well, I, I don't think that things have changed because of that book, sadly, because I think that people don't realize that the book is about interpersonal mindfulness. They just think it's about art, so only people interested in art probably read it. But there are several books that I've written since And I think cumulatively from the first book, Mindfulness, to the last one, which counterclockwise, and the new one that I you know, will publish soon, um, has, has helped change things, the, the world in some way. That, you know, I was in Chicago not that long ago, and there was a restaurant, the name of which was uh, The Mindful Burger. <laughs> and uh, then my students, you know, send me things, the mindful pizza. I mean, the word is out there. I hope it doesn't get distorted too much from what the original meaning is. And many people confuse mindfulness as I study it, and not surprisingly, with meditation. 
and it has nothing to do with meditation. Meditation is fine, but that's an activity you go through to lead to post-meditative mindfulness. Mindfulness as we study it, you know, is immediate. It's not a practice. It's just a way of being that comes about by recognizing you don't know. You just notice new things, you see you don't know, and then you naturally tune into them. I think that there's been a beginning of an evolution in consciousness, some might say a revolution, that yeah, things, things have changed and will continue to change. And that's why I do all this podcast lecturing and writing to, to help facilitate a change, because to my mind, too many people are sealed in unlived lives and that it's time to break the seal and stop being so afraid um, and just get out there and um, be. And people hesitate because they think that all these rules and regulations and routines have been discerned as the only way to be. And so living a life in a tight jacket is not as much fun. Dr. Langer, I think I cannot finish this podcast better. And with that, I want to say really thank you for taking the time to uh, share all your wisdom. I know I enjoy it from reading the book, from listening to other uh, interviews you gave, and definitely from today's conversation. My pleasure, Nir. Stay well. Thanks. I don't know about you, but when I listen to the conversation with Dr. Langer, I found myself writing down her ideas, thoughts, and wisdom. Her words still echo in my mind a few months after we had this conversation. Thinking about so many people that sell out and don't live the life they want, or in many ways, can. It helps me appreciate more my own path. More than ever, I think what we learned this past year or so is that uncertainty is the rule, not the exception. It is how we frame it that will help us deal with it. Let me know how you deal with that by sending me an email, podcast at theartian.com. Special thanks to Dr. Tal Ben Shacha, who told me about Dr. Langer and her work. Until the next time, have a great weekend. I will be here waiting for you with another episode of the Artian Podcast. With me, Nir Hindi. Thanks again for choosing us, listening to us, and staying with us till now. We know that with so many content out there, you chose to listen to this one. So thank you for that. We are producing our podcast without any help. So if you find this valuable for you, I will be super grateful if you can help us spread the word by leaving a rating or a review. It will take you less than a minute and it's really, really valuable for us. Special thanks to Daniel Duran who mixed and mastered this episode and Abigail Dyson, our wonderful intern, who helped us put this podcast out there. If you are interested in working with us and upskilling your team's capabilities, if you are looking to hone and develop an artistic mindset, then I would recommend you to check our workshops and training. All the information is available on our website. You can subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. Our previous shows are available on our website, www.theartian.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We can also be found on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. And you can reach us directly via email at podcast at theartian.com. Once again, thanks for listening. I will be here waiting for you on another episode of The Artian Podcast. <laughs>